All right, we can get started. Um, so welcome everyone. We're so glad to have you here today. Um, before we get started, I wanna remind you all that French and Spanish interpretation is available for this session. To access this, click the interpretation button in the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom window and select either French or Spanish. If you have any questions about interpretation during the meeting, send a message to Julia Randall in the chat. During today's session, we will explore how project teams have adjusted to digital trends in the face of complex operating environments, where internet connectivity is limited, bandwidth and internet coverage remain ad hoc in some places, and the digital divide is more prominent in program operating areas. We will begin with short presentations from Somalia, the Sahel, and Zimbabwe. Then we will spend time collectively brainstorming and problem solving around some common challenges when it comes to bridging the digital divide. Then we will reconvene in the main room in plenary to share out. In order to assign you to the right group according to your preferred language, we ask that you please complete the poll that you should see on your screen now. Please select whether you prefer to join a breakout room facilitated in English or in French, or if you could do either English or French. While you complete this poll, I am thrilled to introduce our three speakers slash facilitators for this session. We have Jafar Sadiq Mohammed. Feel free to wave Jafar Sadiq. He is the team leader of the Resilience Learning Activity in Somalia. Next, we have Nyasha Musandu. She is the Knowledge Management and Digital Communications Specialist for the Resilience Knowledge Hub in Zimbabwe. Last but not the least, we have Abdul Nasser Musa Mumuni, who is the Knowledge Management Specialist for the Sahel Collaboration and Communication Project in Niger. I will now turn you over to Jafar Sadiq, who will share about his experiences in Somalia. Over to you, Jafar Sadiq. Thank you, Camille. Uh, thank you, uh, the rest of the team. Uh, welcome to, to this session. We, we are glad that you were able to join us today and uh, uh, we will be sharing our experiences across the uh, African region as part of uh, uh, teams that have been working together on uh, learning programs that have been connecting under Masiko Bana. So in Somalia, um, the context under which this program uh, that we lead works on that uh, resilience and activity RLM is a program that generally aims to influence the humanitarian and development partners in, in this region of Somalia, whereby uh, our key outcome is like we are trying to prioritize practices that are scalable, cost effective, and collaborative for partners. So, uh, generally, RLA facilitates a platform for uh, partners from USAID and some from other donors also known as Somali Resilience Partnership, uh, commonly abbreviated as SRP. And uh, this platform is a bottom-top approach whereby we use the CLA USAID framework uh, to bring partners together in terms of collaborating, learning, and adapting to, to, to the key uh, realities in the Bay and Bokol region of Somalia. So uh, the platform so far has three donors. One is USAID, or we have also FCDO, formerly known as TIFID, and also we have SDC, uh, Swedish uh, uh, Development Corporation. So we have 12 of uh, USAID implementing partners and three resilience consortia made up of other small uh, other uh, international NGOs. And we have two private partners and government departments participating in this. So this is the context in which uh, RLA operates. And um, RLA is a learning program that is trying to facilitate the gaps between uh, uh, collaboration gaps between partners so that we can reach the collective impact that we intend to see in our programming. Next. Next. Uh, so what, what was the problem in terms of, uh, when it comes to the, uh, the topic at hand, the uh, digital uh, technology and connectivity? Um, when the program was being uh, inception or the implementation started to begin, uh, one key issue is like uh, the program uh, inception uh, 
coincided with, with the start of the pandemic. So, and initially the program was designed uh, to run in, in the physical world with uh, physical meetings, also facilitative recessions and those. Uh, so with the start of the program originally, as we start, uh, the, the pandemic struck. So this forced us uh, automatically to go digital while the original program plan, which was uh, to go start in the physical world, uh, we had that huge divide and we were forced to go virtual. So uh, uh, though it was a good idea at the start, but um, that was not the way it was envisioned. So that's one of the key problems that uh, the program started facing at the start. Also, the program had components where we had regular meetings that are facilitated on a monthly basis for partners at the field level. And uh, we had quarterly meetings that are facilitated at, at, the, at, at the national level for, for the leadership of the partners. So um, with internet issues that we talked about uh, uh, with the internet issues in Somalia and the specific regions we are focusing on, we regularly came across uh, there were technical failures that were happening in the internet, whereby either the infrastructure was down or uh, the technology that we have been starting to use at the start, trying to experiment with the different, uh, was causing a lot of uh, partners to bring uh, to get an access. It's taking time, and so also the quality of internet uh, versus the appropriate technology was an issue. Uh, the most appropriate technologies require a long of bandwidth, so they, 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 there's been an issue there in that in terms of challenge. Despite we want to have the most interactive uh, technology, but the internet quality sometimes cannot support it. So, also uh, in terms of technology, when we came and started implementing and wanted to go virtual, there have been a variety of, of technologies that were available for virtual platforms that uh, took some time before we just settled on one. So, and uh, we're going to discuss in the next uh, subsequent uh, in the subsequent uh, sorry slides so well, how we, we went about that so th this has been a it's a problem out there i know some programs that are trying to start up is zoom good for me is it uh, microsoft teams is it uh, teams or so it came up that uh, uh, that's an issue so another issue is like uh, the technical and internet failures uh, the alternative is, is to have uh, a satellite internet the visa which are generally expensive so uh, that uh, they're generally expensive. So this makes inaccessible to partners, uh, which means there is a lot of investment required. Next. So so what worked well and and uh, under this platform, uh, what we are trying to do. And first, uh, as I talked about some of the problems like the variety of technology and different technology setups that were there. So at RLA, we, we went out and scouted what were the popular virtual platforms that are mainstream in the, in the areas of target that we want to work in. That is uh, uh, by, by trying to see what people have been already using so that we build on that. Uh, specifically, we found out like Zoom and Meet were the most popular platforms the partners used. So we reduce the learning curve for them to, to start learning a new technology, which are the, uh, already the ones that they've been used to and they know their functionality. So this worked well and uh, partners were able to participate and interact much better using the, 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 the platform that they already know. So, uh, so what work, uh, another way that we went around technology is like before we start uh, uh, showcasing or bringing a specific technology to partners to use uh, we ended up signing up for free via trial versions because um, uh, to see uh, also um, the trial versions before paying for it with the key functionalities of the different technologies before we adopt it so by going out with my team and uh, uh, the rest of the team that we've been working with trying to see and coming back and reporting and saying like Yes, this technology has ABC, that's good, but this is the bandwidth requirement. Therefore, it will not be appropriate for, for our internet level or connectivity that we have. So another issue is that uh, we have been having constant internet uh, outages in the region because of some technical failures. So one way of going around that was like trying to schedule meetings to accommodate internet failures, whereby uh, 
we were sharing our calendar in advance, like yearly calendars for, for our key events and key meetings. So our partners can also have time and also in advance make arrangements in, in, uh, in the event that affiliates are coming up. So this was also coupled with establishing multiple contacts to participate, whereby if we have one contact in one region as a primary, where the target work is happening, but in the case that we a blackout or an internet failure happens, then we have a secondary contact that is also uh, following up the same discussions in from another region where probably the, the connectivity is, is still there. So th this provided us with an opportunity to, to, to bring people still with it, continuing the conversation. Also, we, we ended up using low technology, uh, low bandwidth uh, collaboration forums. I know there are a ton of mind mapping uh, websites or even tools out there. But for us, uh, the Google slide or docs uh, for mind mapping discussion, which is very simple, easy, relatable, because it's uh, closely related to already what we are using the Microsoft Office system. So this also was what worked well with people already posting stuff easily rather than uh, using other, uh, it's also low bandwidth in terms of when it comes to to the internet requirement, and then it can be easily already with the familiarity is also there. So, so these are some of the key highlights of what worked well for us. Uh, next video. So uh, in the long run, uh, so, so uh, what didn't work well for us is like uh, the internet blackouts that we had. Uh, the internet, uh, we had long internet blackouts, which was like one month, uh, one month long. So even uh, that brought a lot of challenges for us. Even with the measures that we have put in place, uh, the internet long, long internet blackouts could not be resolved. So this is what we, we decided to work around it when it's available. And also uh, in these cases, like, you know, the partners who were using uh, the satellite version so they could accommodate others in the, in the long run. But, but this also uh, disrupted a lot of what we intended to do in terms of the platform and, and, and the plans that we have. So also different, using different platform, using different technologies also uh, contributed to confusion and fatigue, whereby, uh, uh, when we use uh, a specific technology and then try to try another one and then uh, as, as a team, yeah, it costs, but also to, to the partners, we, we intended to see uh, people trying to, to get tired of like, uh, it's again, the, trying to write up stuff. So I think uh, the, this is also a big challenge that exists along all the digital power. Uh, also knowing that uh, the free versions of technologies that we talked about or the time sometimes may have limited functionality. So we may not fully explore and, and also have full, full understanding sometimes due to, to, to the different uh, technologies. So also uh, some of them have a limited number of participants to see if it works in large groups because uh, uh, in the trial version, it tries to limit the number of participants. So it was notable, it was difficult for us to fully understand uh, some of them, I mean, we would, uh, knowing that some of the limitations are that. So also, uh, I know my colleague will go to, uh, to talk about some of these aspects that is coming. Uh, we had reduced uh, this visual connection. So I know with with, uh, with the visual connection, we create a lot of uh, interactions, but uh, with, uh, uh, with, with connection issues, we could not able even the normal videos that you can able to see and then we get to what difficult due to internet. So uh, that, that's something like uh, uh, issues like uh, to do with the uh, uh, that we have. So uh, we also try to, to move some of the conversation into the social platforms such as WhatsApp, whereby we intended to use this one to uh, bring up some of the conversations to share some photos in terms of what is happening in the context but it seems like this didn't work well. Uh, it seems that this didn't work well with the partners. Uh, and uh, so we, it was not uh, as we anticipated to, to gain the traction it was supposed to gain and give uh, feedback. So uh, slow bandwidth technology have less interactive functionality the way I talked about. Uh, the less uh, bandwidth we talk about, uh, the less interaction that some of these technologies have. So uh, that, that means like, uh, 
we are not able to bring out the maximum interactions that we wanted in terms of uh, what uh, what we intended to do, what we had to set up in between, uh, what the technology allows and the internet, what the technology offers and how much the, te the internet uh, can afford in this in that specific region. Uh, next. So uh, my questions for reflection is, uh, I know most of us have been facing similar challenges like what Aragla faced or what we are facing in Somalia in some areas. And these are some of the questions that probably I wanted us to reflect on as the conversation continues before I hand over to my colleague Yasha. Uh, what uh, we, wa we, want, we want you also to give us, you know, this is the experience that we had, we are sharing, we also want to hear from you. So. How has technology supported your program to transition into your virtual world, specifically in complex contexts like Somalia? Uh, what were the key successes that you had? Uh, in this sense, what, what did work well for you? What challenges have you faced relating to technology or connectivity in complex contexts, and how did you solve them? Um, with those few remarks, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Nasha, to continue with the next segment, and then, uh, uh, we're going to answer some of your questions in the chat box as they arrive. Thank you. Thank you, Jafar Sadiq. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Nyasha Musandu, and I'm going to talk to you about an example from Zimbabwe where we're really looking at engagement and shifting behavior um, as we work in the virtual space. Next. So, just to give you a bit of background, um, this uh, case study is drawn from the Resilience Knowledge Hub, which is a technical partner for the Zimbabwe Resilience Building Fund, which is working in Zimbabwe. And so Mercy Corps is leading um, as the technical partner really around learning, uh, collaboration, um, policy engagement, knowledge management, uh, and gender and youth. We've been working across 18 rural districts. Most of these districts would be what we term region four and five, which is some of our poorer districts within Zimbabwe, which does present us some challenges when we're looking at that leap from the physical space into the digital world. Uh, the fund is compromised of seven consortia, and these consortia are made up of multiple um, partners. In total, we're working with about 29 NGOs across the country. We work at district and national level, um, which meaning that we have um, representatives in the different wards and different districts that we're working in. And we work quite closely with the Ministry of Lands, Agriculture, uh, Water, Fisheries and Rural Resettlement in Zimbabwe. And so we work quite closely with the government in order to implement the program and therefore they become a critical learning part for us. This will be important in explaining some of our challenges um, as we moved forward. Next, please. Right, so what was the problem? The Zimbabwe Resilience Building Fund began in 2016, and um, in many ways, we had interacted the way any program would interact. People were able to meet regularly. We were able to learn and collaborate in um, biannual learning activities. Um, and what this did was, um, it encouraged a sense of camaraderie. So people were able to get to know each other and work quite well in physical spaces. And there was really a sense of community that had been created um, offline with people really having a chance to spend two to three days to delve into some very deep learning agendas and co-create um, learning um, knowledge products. Um, as the pandemic set in, this event had to move um, online. Uh, um, and what this meant is there were some difficulties coordinating learning from different locations. As I said, we're working in 18 rural districts and there was really varying bandwidth um, in these areas. So some areas are low bandwidth areas and various uh, varying accessibility. And by accessibility, I mean, just even the ability of some of our partners to um, be in the field and log on with, um, you know, a laptop and not a phone, for example. Um, so some of those barriers did come up, especially when we were looking at working across um, the different districts. Next slide, please. 
So what worked well? Well, the biannual was actually able to convene over 70 participants, which meant that we were able to see district partners join and keep relatively steady numbers. One of the ways in which this was done was by providing data to some partners in the districts to enable them to join conversations. And also it was really an opportunity where usually physical learning events are limited in number because of some of the cost implications. This was really a good opportunity to engage um, with many more people so different consortia could add different sub partners to the learning event which meant that we could draw from a much bigger and richer pool of expertise and really drawing more on those who are delivering programming on the ground within the dif different districts and so it meant that more people could be in the room and there was really an attempt to have very interactive sessions, including a virtual field visit that was hosted by um, one of the consortia to allow um, other members to see who their key um, beneficiaries were and some of the work they were doing on the ground. But there were also some challenges. So um, as our own room is probably an example of, video content is not always very um, friendly to low bandwidth environments. And so where people wanted to share, um, you know, video or even have um, videos on, right? So when we talk with our videos on, we have a level of connection and engagement that differs from when people's videos are off. So some of the challenges were really about how do we ensure that participants are actually engaging and being in the room uh, and not just signing in and spending the day uh, on other tasks? How do we encourage engagement in a really meaningful manner where bandwidth may not allow things like video content? The other challenge is in this world of online spaces, how do we um, work with the idea of presentations without the continued fatigue? There's a lot to cover. And usually when you're in a, a room, we can go through a presentation, but there's numerous interactions happening um, that make it less monotonous. How do we replicate that or be become more conscious of it? Um, they were really low bandwidth constraints. So while people did get data, what you tend to notice is people drop in and out, which makes it difficult to ensure engagement is sustained and deepened and to ensure that all learners are moving at the same pace because uh, some people drop up for long periods, some people drop on, drop in and out. So how do you create a thread of engagement where people are sharing the same content and on the same page? The other difficulty was around continued engagement. So once the biannual is done, usually that's when we would move on to an online space to follow up. But once you've hosted an activity online, what are those connection points that you can build to enable users to continue to engage around the content without the fatigue that's already been created around some of this online learning? And a real challenge is that around um, equitable participation. So what tends to happen in, in big groups, especially when we're now looking at 70 people, although we might break out into smaller groups for discussion, how do we ensure that that participation is reflected back in the plenary in a, well, in a way that's equitable? How do we ensure that those who are in lower bandwidth um, environments are really able to participate meaningfully. Uh, the tendency tends to be, you know, when we have a connection issue, we overcompensate and all the organizers jump in to make sure things keep moving. But how are we ensuring that all the participants who are in that room with us in this virtual space are equally engaged and equally given opportunity to contribute to that learning that is so valuable? So, um, I'm hoping that when we break out into the breakout room, uh, we can have a very deep discussion and reflection from your own experiences around what online engagement actually looks like. So if you could help us think through and we can create a tip sheet of what metrics we can use to measure engagement. What does it really look like when we say we had 70 people in the room? How do we know that those 70 people were successfully engaged. So I would love to explore that with you. 
And also the second question I'd love for us to talk through is, what are some of the low technology interactive solutions for big groups in bandwidth constrained environments? So my colleague Jafar Sadiq referred earlier to some of the challenges they had trying to find, you know, um, platforms and technology that met their needs. What are some of these um, platforms that maybe you have used that encourage people to take part, but don't require someone to have quite an extensive um, bandwidth? Um, what are some of those things that you've done? We'd really love to reflect on that with you. So I look forward to speaking to you when we do break out into the groups. But for now, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Abdul Nasser, who is going to talk about what some of the budget implications were and really give um, a bit of a, a highlight and a case study from Burkina Faso and Niger. I'd also like to just remind people that this section will be conducted in French. So if you do need translation services, as Camille said in the beginning, please just make sure you go to the interpretation at the bottom of your screen and select the language that you would like to receive information in. We have English, we have Spanish, and we have French. Thank you, Abdul Nasser. Okay, merci donc à Jafar Sadiq et à Nesha d'avoir fait leur présentation. Moi, c'est Moussa Abdel Nasser. Je suis du projet Sahel Collaboration Communication, donc euh, au Niger. Et le projet Sahel Collaboration et Communication SCC euh, intervient dans deux zones, le Niger et le Burkina Faso qui sont dans l'Afrique de l'Ouest et qui est une zone sahélienne qui fait face à des crises alimentaires et chocs récurrents. Donc, projet, plusieurs pro projets et programmes interviennent dans ce Sahel et le rôle du SCC est d'assurer la coordination des projets et programmes financés par USAID en promouvant la collaboration, l'apprentissage et l'adaptation. Donc, euh, en mars 2020, au moment où juste le SCC sortait de sa période de raffinement et annonçait les premiers cas du COVID-19 au Niger et au Burkina. Slide. Donc, maintenant, quel était le problème? Et le SCC devait commencer par compléter ses, ses, ses effectifs pour le bon démarrage de ses activités dans le contexte de la COVID. Donc, en ce temps-là, nous n'avons pas <coughs> tous les collègues qui étaient présents et nous devons essayer de faire le recrutement pendant cette phase de COVID-19. Le deuxième problème, c'est que nous devons commencer aussi à mettre en œuvre nos activités au Niger et au Burkina avec des partenaires qui, la plupart d'entre eux, étaient en confinement, leur bureau était fermé. Ou même s'ils n'avaient pas les bureaux fermés, ils avaient des staffs limités. Et sur le terrain, il y a un accès euh, très limité à l'Internet. Maintenant, le, deux, le troisième problème, c'est que certains même de nos staffs étaient à l'international en ce temps-là et ne pouvaient pas rejoindre l'équipe soit au Niger ou au Burkina Faso pour cause de la COVID-19. Slide. Bon, mais le SCC, a, dans son rôle normalement, qu'il devait enseigner aux autres, ça veut dire l'adaptation, a commencé par euh, se, se faire le sens soi-même. Nous avons voulu commencer par adapter nos activités nos programmes. Et l'adaptation implique, euh, l'adaptation donc des activités implique forcément euh, l'adaptation en termes budgétaires. Dans un premier temps, donc euh, pour le cas du recrutement, au lieu de le faire en présentiel pour les tests euh, écrits et les entretiens, nous avons euh, commencé par tester de faire les tests en, en ligne. Maintenant, pour les entretiens aussi, nous avons testé de faire les entretiens par Skype pour 
les candidats qui avaient une bonne connexion Internet ou bien qui habitent dans, dans des zones vraiment là où la connexion est bonne, ou même on essaie de les appeler par, euh, par téléphone, donc euh, avec euh, leur numéro, et on essaie de faire le recrutement comme ça. Et pour ce faire, on avait doté les comités de recrutement en crédit Internet et crédit pour pouvoir faire ces appels. Et pour le deuxième cas, c'est la mise en œuvre donc, des activités. Là, à ce niveau, nous les avons scindées en deux. Pour les activités qui peuvent être faites en ligne et les activités qui, obligatoirement, doivent se faire en présentiel. Maintenant, pour les activités qui peuvent se faire en ligne, nous sommes dotés d'un certain nombre de matériels. D'abord, la connexion Internet pour nos deux bureaux, ici au Niger et au Burkina Faso. Et cette connexion a été dédoublée parce que nous avons deux Wi-Fi pour pouvoir, bien sûr, maintenir l'efficacité de la connexion Internet pendant les activités. Nous avons aussi acquis un grand écran de, de, de télévision pour pouvoir faire les projections et surtout pour pouvoir créer vraiment l'environnement qui va faire comprendre aux gens comme s'ils si sont en présentiel. Et nous avons aussi acquis un dispositif eh, audiovisuel qui intègre la caméra et le son pour encore plus permettre aux, aux gens de plus interagir et de vraiment être plus présent lors des, des discussions à travers les vidéos qui sont là et les sont disponibles. Et nous avons aussi pris des abonnements Meet et Zoom parce que ce sont les deux technologies peut-être qui sont les mieux répandues ici au, au Sahel. Donc presque tous nos partenaires s'ils n'utilisent pas Zoom, ils utilisent Meet. Donc, le SCC a pris l'abonnement pour ces deux et un abonnement qui peut nous permettre d'accueillir plus de 100 personnes en ligne. Mais là, il y a des moments où, parmi nos partenaires, ils ne peuvent pas avoir une très bonne connexion à Internet. Peut-être même du fait qu'ils n'ont pas les moyens pour pouvoir s'offrir une très bonne connexion à Internet. Et que le SCC, par le moment, est demandé de travailler avec ses partenaires. Donc, nous les invitons dans nos locaux et pour ce faire, nous avons fait un redimensionnement de notre salle, et la salle qui est censée faire euh, ou bien lieu de réunion, salle de réunion. Donc, ce redimensionnement est, est fait pour pouvoir respecter le principe de la distanciation sociale pour ceux qui veulent participer euh, à des réunions en présentiel avec le, le SCC ou même quand le SCC et ses staffs veulent se réunir. Et maintenant, pour toutes ces technologies qu'on avait payées, les staffs étaient obligés d'être formés pour pouvoir les maîtriser, parce que ce sera un outil de travail pendant toute la période de COVID. Et nous avons aussi doté à les personnels en téléphone et des crédits, Internet et appels supplémentaires parce qu'il y a des moments où le pays, soit le Niger ou le Burkina, décide d'aller en confinement. Et on veut être toujours en lien avec les staffs. Ou même la structure du fait, par exemple, d'un cas suspect ou d'un cas eh, COVID détecté, donc part en confinement. Et pour que les gens puissent travailler eh, de, de par chez eux, le SCC aussi a doté ses staffs de crédit. Internet et des crédits d'appel. Donc, tous, toutes ces choses que je viens de citer font en sorte qu'il euh, y avait eu un réménagement du budget. Donc, le budget a été revu pour certaines activités qui n'étaient pas prévues. Nous avons pu, euh, comment on appelle ça, revoir euh, le budget pour amputer sur l'autre pour pouvoir créer euh, ou bien permettre de, 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 de payer ces, 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 ces matériels et ces technologies. Slide. Slide. Maintenant, qu'est-ce qui n'a pas bien marché? Ah, bon, le, le nouveau matériel 
payé n'était pas dans les installations parce que le, le SCC avait des installations solaires dans un premier temps, donc euh, qui a été fait sur mesure avec presque tout ce dont nous, nous avons dès le début pour pouvoir fonctionner. Maintenant, avec l'arrivée des nouveaux matériels et l'extension de la salle qui a fait installer aussi plusieurs euh, matériels pour le confort, donc ça a impacté sur la consommation en termes d'énergie qui a fait qu'il va falloir euh, réaugmenter la puissance de nos panneaux et aussi et pour nos partenaires, même si d'autres nous voulons les, 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 les impliquer dans les activités, si eux n'ont pas cette possibilité ou même la facilité, parce qu'il peut y avoir le cas, la possibilité ou la facilité de pouvoir faire euh, les réaménagements budgétaire pour, pour pouvoir souffrir les technologies qui peuvent nous permettre d'être en contact avec eux. Nous, le SCC, nous n'avons pas cette possibilité d'aller plus rapidement intervenir, euh, comment ça s'appelle, à leur niveau, pour que nous puissions mettre en œuvre les, les activités. Donc euh, aussi, il y a le, le défi de la limite, parce que nous avons beau faire euh, les réaménagements, il y a toujours une limite qui est là, qui est au, pour la salle de, de réunion qu'on ne, qu ne peut pas dépasser. Maintenant, c'est que peut-être pour un peu eh, revenir au, au passage eh, de tout à l'heure, ces choses-là, ces réaménagements ont été vraiment possibles plus facilement parce que le SCC avait un bailleur qui était à l'écoute, un bailleur qui était vraiment flexible et surtout dans le contexte de la covid c'est ça qui a permis au SCC vraiment de déployer plus facilement ses, ses activités, même pendant la période du COVID-19. Mais il faut juste retenir que eh, cette COVID-19, malgré tout ce que nous avons fait, eh, il y a des activités qui n'ont pas pu être réalisées, et peut-être de grosses activités qui obligatoirement avaient été reportées. Et c'est ce qui avait eh, un peu occasionné... Eh, une faible consommation budgétaire vraiment pendant l'année COVID-19. Slide. Maintenant, les questions que nous nous sommes posées à un certain moment, c'était comment pouvons-nous surmonter les contraintes, les contraintes auxquelles nous sommes confrontés. Est-ce que nous travaillons avec des partenaires qui ont des difficultés pour ajuster leur budget et pour relever aussi des défis de connectivité. La deuxième question, c'est quelle est la solution peut-être moins coûteuse qui pourrait aider à relever les défis de connectivité dans les contextes complexes comme celui du Sahel? Donc, je vous remercie. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abdul Nasser. Um, and thank you to everybody for engaging with us. So what we're going to do now is to break out into some groups and respond to the questions that have been posed um, across the three presentations. If I could ask before I give out the instructions, If anybody joined late um, or didn't manage to respond to the poll that was conducted at the beginning of the, se of the session, um, if you could just indicate in the chat box if you would like to be put in an English or French group for the discussion uh, so that you can be assigned the appropriate room. So the instruction, if you could just put English or French into the chat box, so that you can be assigned the appropriate room for the breakout sessions. Now, what we're going to do in the breakout rooms, um, Julia will send us our merry way. Um, and what we will do in each group is there's a Google slide um, document that um, we're all going to work in simultaneously. Uh, Julia will put the link in the chat box for everybody to get there. We're going to identify 
um, one person in each group who's going to come back and feed back to plenary. So before you begin your deliberations, please agree on a note taker who will come back and reflect on some of the highlights of your discussion. And then what we're going to do is we're going to respond to the questions that were posed in the presentations on the sticky notes uh, in the Google slide. And we're going to discuss the responses as a group and we will identify what these responses, which ones are the most um, important. And why we're doing this is to develop a tip sheet for others about some ways that we can navigate some of the connectivity issues that have been presented in moving into a virtual world. Um, I hope that instruction is clear. Um, if there are any questions, maybe we can raise them once we get to the group or you can throw them in the chat box before we um, go off. Julia, over to you to assign us the appropriate rooms. Camille, I don't think we're able to hear you. Oh. You're very faint. I think it's Jaharsidi. Yeah, yeah, I think. Uh... Our team, uh, we have already selected Benita, who will going to present uh, uh, basically some of the key outcomes for, for group one under, under technology and, and connectivity. Benita, welcome. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. I was muted. So here are some of the um, some of the things that our group uh, talked about, um, some of the um, ways in which technology supported uh, the program um, and, tr and trans transitioning to the virtual world. We, um, in some cases, uh, were able to conduct trainings for in-person data collection that was still uh, able to continue uh, virtually uh, rather than in person, we, you know, people could travel or, or people couldn't travel. And so we were able to do the trainings um, uh, virtually. Uh, and in some cases, uh, there was um, the ability to conduct some types of data collection uh, by phone um, and, and replacing, um, replacing the in-person that was, that, you know, that was in limited, um, in limited uh, cases where, you know, there was uh, data for our phone numbers for our respondents and we had an ongoing relationship with respondents. Um, of course, the technology could, re we can reach uh, people remotely, um, so that helped um, when people couldn't travel. Uh, conducting uh, virtual learning sessions and program closeout sessions um, with, with the donors, with headquarters, um, regional partners, et cetera. All of those things were made possible by technology. Uh, con uh, contacting, um, again, training sessions with field staff, local partners, uh, able to hold coaching uh, sessions on the phone with folks. Um, conduct staff meetings uh, via Zoom and 
um, you know, able to just connect when a lot, when, when, you know, in, in person and regular types of things were disrupted. Um, so it had that the technology helped in all those situations. Uh, and then in terms of the challenges, uh, lots of challenges with lots of challenges, um, internet issues, uh, access, uh, bandwidth, um, you know, people that lots of different platforms, learn, trying to learn how to use those platforms, um, working with, with um, it, uh, attendees for sessions on how to just navigate and, and use the technology, uh, th those kinds of things. Um, I, I think connectivity was hu is huge. Um, not everyone was able to, uh, have, you know, the, the, the physical equipment was not always available to folks, um, computers, whatever. Um, oftentimes people would have to, in, in some cases, people could move into one large room and be able to, you know, uh, participate uh, that way. Um, but um, the, the, these were a lot of a lot of the challenges. Uh, and we uh, in terms of in terms of um, solving these problems, it was just you know, I, I think all of these problems can well, it can't always be solved, but working the best to the best ability that we could to help folks to be able to have access to understand the platforms and, and things like that. So thank you. I think I think that's that's our our uh, report. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Benita, for for the, for covering for group. Next group, Nyasha and Tim. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, we have Errol representing us with the feedback from our group. Hello. Thank you, Yasha. Um, in our group, there are 10 participants, 10, 9, 10 participants. And this is our questions. What does online engagement look like? What are the metrics we can use to measure engagement? Well, basically, we discuss about using chat when when video is off, the target part we have to target the participants before who is it for? Like if it is for women, it's for women. If it is for men, it is for men. Then ta tailoring to connectivity device and other apps and constraints each target audience. Um, it would also help if we know the demographic data of the participants, like their gender, their age, and their location. And um, there's also a discussion of building a lot of interaction opportunities like we will not use only one um, platform. We use chat, Google Docs, break, uh, breakout rooms. Then we have take out, take, take quick polls, use Google Docs. So we have to use many, many platforms for us to engage the, the participants. Second question, what are low technology interactive solutions for big groups in bandwidth constrained environments? We can use a lot of uh, platforms like the Miro boards and combine offline and online activity there's also a suggestion that send pre-work two weeks in advance or one week in advance, answer offline, and they have to submit it. And uh, keep it simple. You know, um, there's also a suggestion to use minty.com. Um, think about different levels of engagement appropriate to audience. Uh, for the third question. Uh, yes. Um, the, the, the third question, how can we work around the constraints we face when working with partners who have difficulty adjusting their budget? So during the pandemic, I mean, before the pandemic, there's budget on travel, there's budget on hotel. But since there's pandemic, we can shift this uh, budget into providing internet package to our partner organizations um, based on their needs. Uh, during project proposal also, we should include internet connectivity to our partners. Um, the donor will see it as a practical solution. And it was also mentioned that what, um, the challenges of digital platform is how much uh, data information are we sharing to the digital group? How do we address this protection issue and how do we ensure that we include vulnerable people or persons who identify themselves as deaf and, and mute? How can we include them 
in our um, in our digital discussion. So I think that's most of the discussion we have. Um, Nyasha can can add more if there are some things that I missed. Thank you. Thank you, Errol. There's nothing that you missed. We were perfectly represented. I will um, at, send it over to Abdul Nasser's group um, to talk through what you discussed. Merci, l'équipe verte. Donc, c'est pour l'implication budgétaire et des ressources. Je vais laisser Awe Drago Leon pour présenter. Merci. Merci, Nasser. Pour notre équipe essentiellement des de francophones, pour la première question en lien avec euh, comment surmonter les contraintes auxquelles nous sommes confrontés, euh, nous, nous avons pensé qu'il faut euh, essayer, comme d'autres partenaires l'ont fait, de réviser les budgets euh, afin de faire des économies et redistribuer ces, ces économies-là euh, aux partenaires en accord avec euh, le bailleur. La deuxième option que nous avons retenue était d'inviter les partenaires dans les locaux du projet tout en veillant au respect des mesures barrières. Pour ce qui est de la deuxième question en lien avec les solutions peu coûteuses, euh, de façon unanime, je ressort que euh, les réseaux sociaux, notamment WhatsApp, Telegram et autres, euh, en tout cas, sont des moyens assez euh, très, très bien dans nos contextes pour pouvoir poursuivre en tout cas le travail. Nous avons aussi euh, aimé l'idée que euh, on peut toujours utiliser les téléphones mobiles en s'appuyant sur certains leaders sociaux pour qu'ils vont relayer les différentes informations au niveau des euh, de différentes localités dans nos zones d'intervention. Nous avons pensé aussi que euh, promouvoir les plateformes de stockage documentaire serait un excellent moyen quand même euh, de mettre la documentation à la disposition de ceux, par exemple, qui, d'une manière ou d'autre, n'ont pas accès à Internet à un temps précis mais qui peuvent, à la longue, dans la semaine ou dans un mois, avoir un endroit où ils ont accès à Internet et télécharger ainsi l'ensemble de la documentation en lien et pourquoi pas contribuer aussi à renforcer, euh, ce, 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 en tout cas, cette plateforme-là. Et bon, nous avons pensé aussi à Team de, de Microsoft, mais euh, là-dessus, il faut dire que euh, les, inter les, les intervenants ont notamment, notamment relevé que euh, cet outil est parfois... Euh, comporte un peu les mêmes contraintes que Zoom, notamment en termes de coûts et en termes de bandes passantes. En tout cas, voici un peu euh, nos réflexions pour ce point-là. Je vous remercie. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Fantastic. So those were three groups of everyone that has participated in this session. Thank you all for participating. If you have any additional thoughts or comments, please go ahead and use, it, use the chat box. Um, we will be working on a tip sheet with the inputs that you have shared during the session, and we will share the final product with participants in this session. Um, I do want to invite you all to the final session of this learning event. Julia is about to paste the link to that session in the chat. IDEAL and USAID Bureau for Humanitarian Affairs colleagues will facilitate reflection and have a discussion and key takeaways from this learning event. As you all know, we've been doing this event. This is the fourth day, so we have... We've had 43 sessions um, across the four days. Um, that said, we would love your feedback on this session in particular. Please take a few minutes to complete the session feedback form that Julia has just shared in the chat. It only takes three minutes, even one minute, actually, even less. <laughs> it's two buttons and a few words. Um, lastly, as is our, our tradition here at IDEAL, we would love to take a group photo if you were if you were in, in an in-person learning event, you would obviously take pictures, but we can't, so we're going to take a screenshot. So if you can, turn on your cameras just for a, just for a few um, seconds. Wonderful. It's so good to see people's faces instead of black squares. Um, and Julia is about to take a screenshot of, of, of all of us. So smile. <laughs> 
Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Um, with that, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your experiences and learning from the group. We hope to see you in the Taking the Learning Forward session. Um, we would love to have you there. Thank you all so much. And thank you to Miyasha Jafar Sadiq and Abdul Nasser, Abdul Nasser. Thank you all. See you in the next session. Bye. Bye. Thank Merci. you. Thank you.